Pavlina. I'm Pavlina. I'm on the Victorian Committee. Um, we're here today to talk about thingy regulations and some of you might know that I was one of those people who fought really, 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 really hard against these regulations. And all year, um, we've kind of been in this adversarial sort of fighting mode, I suppose you would say. And I just want you to know that from my perspective, that was about fighting politics and fighting the letter of the law, so to speak. Whereas what I see us now is in a relationship building phase. So um, I'm part of the Victorian Home Ed Advisory Committee. And I have to say, as a home educator, I have been absolutely staggered at how responsive the people from DET and VIQA have been on that committee. And their willingness to work with us and their willingness to listen. And from my perspective going forward, I think it's really, really important that we focus on building relationships, um, long-term relationships, good working relationships, so that we let them know about how home ed works so that they can better understand our community and better understand. Um, so one of the people on that committee is Chris Ingham, who's the acting CEO of VRQA. And he's been an absolute delight to work with. And um, he's going to start us off talking about the regs. Thanks very much, Pavlina, for that uh, warm introduction. Oh. Thanks very much, Pavlina, for that warm introduction. Uh, tonight's a bit of uh, an unusual session. Not unusual as in bad, but it's a different session because apart from the people here, we've got up to 200 people signed up to, for our live stream. And we're probably going to put the video on our website as well as our transcript. So we're playing it a bit by ear. Uh, at certain stages, we'll see if we can answer questions that have been submitted online. Otherwise, we'll have a conversation uh, here. So um, just because Pavlina and I will both be giving presentations, don't feel you have to sit there silently <laughs> and wait for us to. So let, in other words, let me get going for a couple of minutes and then just interrupt with comments, questions whatever you like. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm Chris from the VRQA. I'm new to homeschooling. I've been doing it for a few months. We used to look after apprenticeship and traineeship regulation. Uh, and so, although that's a very different area, if I occasionally draw comparisons, you'll, you'll understand why. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to do in this presentation and for those who are here, the presentation I'm giving is in the gift pack, the show bag. For those who are not, the presentation I understand is being projected. Uh, but it will also be, you'll also find all of the materials in the show bag on the VRQA website. And you'll find the presentation that Pavlina is giving, I think, on the HEN website, the Home Education Network website. Okay. So let me cut to the chase. Uh, there's sort of three or four categories to talk about around the new homeschooling regulations that come. Yep. There's three or four main categories to talk about in relation to the new homeschooling regulations. Things such as learning plans, exemptions, and annual reviews. And uh, the extent that those different aspects of the new re regulations apply to you and your child or children depends on the circumstances. So this slide is about if your child is already registered. So if you've got a child who's already registered for homeschooling and you intend to continue with that registration for next year. There's, in that case, there's a lot of features of the new regulations that will not apply in that circumstance. Uh, if you've got an existing child, things such as the need to put in a learning plan or the need to apply for exemptions from the provision of one or more of the eight learning areas, 
don't apply to you. And importantly, the important point to make is they will never apply to you or your child in those circumstances. A learning plan incorporating an exemption request where relevant only applies to new applications at the point of application from 1 January 2018. And if you are a continuing uh, homeschooler uh, child, if you understand what I mean, the fact that new regulations come in on 1st of January doesn't mean you have to put in a new application. And because you don't have to do a new application, that means you also don't have to do a learning plan or apply for exemptions. Where you uh, might be affected by the new aspects of the new regulations is in the right-hand column there for 2018. There's a 10% chance that your child will be selected for review, annual review. And we'll talk about annual reviews later, what, what they actually mean. When I say 10% chance, uh, I'm no mathematician, but your chances increase the more children you have registered for homeschooling. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll stop there. Any questions? Do they increase each year your chance of being selected? Or uh, again, like if you're selected one year, do they continue the next, like, you start again? So if you're selected, so in 2019, will you be a year selected? Is there a 10% chance you'll be selected in 2020? Yeah, okay. So I'll repeat the question for those at home. Uh, the 10% chance, does it increase as years pass or does it start again? Yeah. Te technically, it starts again each year. So a double-barreled answer to that question. If you have a child who is picked up in the 10% one year yes. and the review happens, and the review's fine, get through. Yes. Your family will be exempted from annual reviews yes. for two years. Thank you for that. Counting that's inclusively. So if a child was reviewed in 2018, yeah, yeah. your family would be excluded from the review sample pool in 2019 and 2020, and but might be picked up again in 2021. Thank you for no problem. Okay, now, there's another category which is my child is not yet registered. Uh, so this applies for anyone here or anyone online who doesn't have a child in the homeschooling system yet but is thinking about it, or other parents or guardians who do have a child or children in homeschooling but have got other children that are not yet and they're thinking about it, okay? The, there's a key point I want to make here, and that is, if you imagine 1 January 2018, separating these two lines, if you put in an application for your child, who's not yet registered, for registration for homeschooling, at any point up until 31st of December this year, that application is under the, the old or existing system. And what that means is that you won't have to put in a learning plan or apply for any exemptions. So for those of you with children registered, you might remember that the existing registration process is a, is a two-page form with associated uh, documentation, birth certificates and so on. That system stays intact until the 31st of December this year. Now, the other thing to mention is you can nominate a start date that is up to six months out from when you put in your application. So in other words, you could theoretically put in an application for registration uh, tomorrow. I was going to say today, you probably can't do it today. And tomorrow is the 16th of November. You could nominate a start date up until 16th of May. And that application does not require a learning plan or, or exemption, right? It's under the existing system. Does that make sense? Okay. From 1 January 2018, and it doesn't matter whether you've got other children who are already registered for homeschooling 
or not, any application after 1 January 2018, the great news is features from all the great features of the new regulatory regime. Right, no one laughed. I've got a few laughs at other sessions over that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that now. From 1 January 2018, all applications will need to be submitted with a learning plan. Applications for exemptions, where relevant, I'll get into that. And also, there's still the 10% chance of an annual review. So I'm going to talk in detail about what these, what do we mean, what, what, do we, what is the VRQA looking for in terms of learning plan requirements? What are the grounds for exemption? And uh, what's going to be happening during annual review? And Pavlina is going to particularly talk more about annual review. Okay. Learning plans. Now, um, for those that are here in their gift pack, you've got two blank learning plan templates. These are templates that have been developed by the Victorian Home Education Advisory Committee, which Pavlina and I are on. The important point to make is they're not compulsory. You can use them if you want to. You don't have to use them. You can use something that's your own creation. You can start with a blank piece of paper. They've been developed uh, as suggestions and as guidance. And they've been developed to be fit for purpose for the regulations. So what, do, what do the regulations say? The regulations say... The regulations say that... Uh, the parent or guardian of a, of a homeschooling child must um, uh, be responsible for an education program that, taken as a whole, substantially covers eight learning areas. Okay? Now, that wording, taken as a whole, substantially covers eight learning areas. Let me break that down a little. There's a lot of flexibility in those words. Is it the responsibility of a homeschooling parent to guarantee that they're covering all eight learning areas all of the time? No, it is not. Does substantially covering the eight key learning areas mean a numerical majority? Is it five of the eight, six of the eight, or 4.25 of the eight? No, it is not. Under the regulations, will the VRQA say that some learning areas are more important than others? So that it's okay to have all these exemptions, but, but maths and English are more important. No, we won't. The regulations do not have a hierarchy of learning areas. So therefore, what does it mean? Substantially taken as a whole, covering our key learning areas. We asked an eminent barrister whose answer was, it depends. And not terribly useful, but behind that answer was, it depends on the individual circumstances of the child as determined by the parent or guardian. People are different, to state the bleeding obvious, I guess. Uh, so some people, uh, and I'm going to use some terms that are sometimes considered pejorative, but some children are very advanced, whatever that means. Some children have uh, learning needs or have, uh, or have uh, abilities that manifest in different ways. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the, we're going to take a horses for courses approach. Uh, let, let me give one example. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have up on the VRQA website um, filled out examples of learning plan templates uh, as, as guidance. Uh, and these learning plan templates have been developed by our homeschoolers on the VHEAC. Uh, and so we think it's sometimes it's better to visualise 
than to try and explain, because sometimes it's hard to explain, as you can see me struggling right now. Uh, in one of those examples that will go up, there's an example of a child who is in difficult circumstances, who has gone through psychological trauma, had very bad experience at a previous school or schools, who is going through a stage where they're shut in, fairly non-communicative, staying in their bedroom, uh, fairly non-social, angry. And so in that example, a learning plan comes in which says, you know what, we would like an exemption from seven of the eight learning areas. What we want to focus on is socialisation, interaction, a gradual progression back to regular life, if you like. Is that learning plan for that circumstance acceptable under, under the new regulations? Yes, it is. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, just for the benefit for those at home. So the question was, uh, in that case, would there need to be some sort of uh, letter or certification from, say, a school principal? And also, would there need to be medical documentation of some sort? The answer to both questions is no. It's the individual circumstances of the child as reported by the parent. In your gift pack, there's a FAQs document which says what I'm about to say. The VRQA, under the, now and under the new regulations, will not be asking or requesting any type of medical or specialist documentation at all. It's your word that matters. The second thing is, uh, for registration for homeschooling, you don't need a permission slip from a school principal or anybody else for that matter. It's the parent that decides. Okay? So that's a public commitment. It's fine for me to say it here or even live stream it, but it's in the gift pack, the VRQA policy. Okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, in, let me just go back to the nuts and bolts of learning plans and I'll refer to this slide. So learning plans, and the regulations ask parents to talk about when and where learning takes place. You'll see in these examples that will go up on the VRQA website, we're looking for general and indicative information, not comprehensive information. This isn't the core of the learning plan, to be honest. So. Well, I'll explain. So when, when it says when instruction will take place, when does not mean that you have to account for every minute, every week, every month uh, of, of what you're doing. When refers to a uh, sort of general routine, if you have one. Is learning taking place on weekdays? Is it mainly a morning thing? Does it happen some nights? Uh, and Pavlina will provide an example, two sentences. Uh, remember, there's nothing in the regulations that requires homeschooling parents to mimic a timetable of a, a school or anything like that. So we're not asking for much there. Uh, the same with uh, where. Uh, a couple of sentences there, I mean, homeschooling in most cases imagine is, is home-based. And, but there may be a learning activity taking place through uh, collaboration with other homeschoolers, community groups, visits to libraries, etc. Subject matter that will be covered during the first year of registration. Now, um, you'll see in the templates in your pack and templates on the website, there's two different templates that are provided. One is sort of a more old-fashioned disciplinary approach. It asks, what are you doing for English? What are you doing for maths? What are you doing for arts, etc.? And another is a, a more integrated design template, which is particularly useful for child-directed learning approaches. 
So instead of that old-fashioned way, it's talk about the types of activities that you do and then uh, link it to the learning areas. Okay? Uh, so let me give an example. I've been thinking about how I would fill it in if I was enrolling, uh, trying, seeking to register my six-year-old daughter, who is not homeschooled, who goes to a registered school, but I, just to give you a flavour. For English, my daughter Mariana likes, uh, I'll probably write that she'd do, we'd probably go to the library uh, intermittently to browse and borrow books. She likes Peppa Pig, Billy B. Brown, Charlie and Lola, because she likes them, she's more likely to read them, so we'll focus on that. I'd probably sit down and help her sometimes, sometimes she'd do independent reading. Uh, she likes to write little stories. She has her own special notebook. So uh, I'd probably, well, I do sit down with her and talk to her about what she's doing, what's going through her mind, help her out on sort of the sort of boring stuff like uh, grammar and spelling and so on. But then, uh, actually, you know, there shouldn't be education department. Official calling uh, grammar and spelling boring, live to air, anyway, but it is. And, uh, but I'll probably talk to her also around, you know, construction of narrative, what she's thinking about. So I'll probably write a paragraph or two on that, and that's it. And then I'd submit it to myself as regulator and sign myself off. Um, the point I want to make about that is, I understand other, that under, in some other jurisdictions, there's sort of a checklist of what English means, or the different components of English. Uh, so it'd be possible that in that circumstance, someone would say, well, there's reading and writing, there's grammar, there's, uh, there's construction of narrative, but where's oral presentation? Too bad, not good enough, go back to the parent. There's nothing like that in the Victorian system. So probably what's a bit different about the Victorian system is that there is no mandated uh, curriculum or teaching and learning approach. You don't have to follow the Victorian curriculum. You don't have to follow the Australian curriculum. You don't have to use the word curriculum or follow any particular curriculum. And because, so, and, so, and this is again a public commitment, all approaches, so homeschooling are valid, ranging from unschooling through to various traditions, Montessori, Steiner, or more structured approaches, or a parent's individual approach that doesn't need to be labelled, right? It's all learning. Uh, and so therefore, because it doesn't have that sort of uh, very sort of uh, structured or mandatory approach, you must follow, you must use these resources, you must follow this curriculum. It means that we also have an open approach to assessment. So in that case, what I indicated about my child for English would be fine. Does that make sense? Let me pause there and see if there are any questions. What's unschooling? What's unschooling? Uh, so uh, I'll give my understanding in a sentence or two and then Pavlina will do it much more <laughs> properly when she presents. Uh, so my understanding is that unschooling rejects the rigidity of the sort of 19th century bricks and mortar, chalk and talk approach to education as ineffective and disengaging. Am I doing so far? And uh, instead, uh, uh, a parent or guardian will be well attuned to what works best for their child. Uh, so therefore, it re rejects structures, if you like, as the basis for an education program. So if a child is particularly passionate around particular activities, or particular types of learning, uh, then the parent will follow. So in other words, it doesn't need a set curriculum or set texts and resources, etc. Am I getting that all right? You can elaborate later on. Yeah. So under the regulations, that approach 
is just as legitimate as sort of more structured approaches that you might see at a registered school. It's all right. Any questions, comments to date? If anything online that's interesting, Alan? Online. So I've got one that um, says, for reviews, it states who will be notified in writing. Does that mean that snail mail or email? Yeah, everyone heard that? No, I didn't, no, no, I didn't hear it. Yeah, okay. So the question was, um, for reviews, will parents, guardians be notified by snail mail or email or phone calls? Uh, so the answer to that is, uh, we've got in our database about 90% of parents and guardians, I understand we've got the email address for, so notification would be by, by our email. Where we don't, it defaults to snail mail. And if we don't hear anything from you, we'll call you. Yep, that's one. Is there, maybe take one more. Um, and will you advise people each year that everyone for the current review year is now advised or notified and then we can all calm down and get back to school? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we will. So we'll be doing the notification early in the calendar year, February or March. And uh, so, yeah, I'm happy to make that commitment that we'll put up on our website um, you know, at some point in March, the 10% have been notified. What I won't put is, so the rest of you can relax. <laughs> because the reviews will be awesome for everyone. Okay. Um, so, uh, the details of the educational materials and resources proposed to be used. This is for the learning plan. Again, it's indicative here. We're not looking for comprehensive information. The key word is plan, right? You're not going to have perfect knowledge of, of, of everything you're going to be doing. I'll probably draw a, draw a distinction here between when I went to a registered school in the 70s and 80s, it was so structured that I knew that in term three, we'd be studying a particular text, a Shakespeare, a Great Expectations, etc. Uh, we're not we're not requiring that here. So details of the educational materials and resources were supposed to be used. It means you don't have to name individual texts or things. It's just sort of the indicative approach that you'll have. And Pavlina will give examples of that. Uh, okay. I'll pause there. Any more questions around learning plans? Yep. Yep. So the question was, in what circumstances would learning plans uh, be refused as part of an application? Uh, basically, in the circumstance where, so the regulations say, once again, is there evidence of a learning plan, or in this case, a proposed learning plan, that taken as a whole covers the eight learning areas? If for whatever reason a submitted learning plan uh, was was so devoid of any information uh, that there was there was nothing at all proposed in relation to three or four of the learning areas, and yet there was no request for an exemption, then uh, it's not going to be refused straight away. In that case, it would be a, a call to the applicant to say, thanks very much for that, thanks for the learning plan. We think it needs more in these areas for these reasons before it satisfies that regulatory requirement. Uh, or do you want to apply for an exemption? And then there's a couple of weeks to think about that and work on that. Uh, so I can have another go. Uh, in worst case scenario, even after that communication and another opportunity, nothing happens. Uh, or we don't have in front of us. What does a regulator do? Um, a regulator, um, what, uh, in some ways, put it this way, a regulator, at the point that they feel they're comfortable, they've got information in front of them that meets the regulatory requirements, they sign off. Okay, uh, and so if initially we aren't quite there, there's another opportunity. If for whatever reason it just doesn't happen, 
from the applicant's end, then in those circumstances, an application could be refused. <coughs> Yes, um, there, there will be. So um, the question was uh, where there is, where the BRQA contacts an applicant to ask for, for example, further information for a learning plan, uh, will there be a verification of those processes in written form? And the answer to that is yes. So what we're thinking of doing is where there's a phone conversation, for example, um, the VRQA officer will then email you with dot points to say, do you agree we discussed this? And, uh, and you are, whatever it is, going to provide information on this and then we'll continue your application. And then you can say, you can respond and say, yes, that's what's happening or uh-uh, I think you got that wrong. And then it starts again, yeah. That's right. Learning plans. Any questions, questions about, about learning plans um, from online? Yes, I've got one. Um, so if a child needs to be removed from school immediately due to trauma or an unsafe school environment due to bullying or something of that nature, it would be problematic um, for the parent to have to take time to set a specific learning plan prior to the removal from the school. Please comment. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think the issue there is um, acknowledging that in particular circumstances, parents and guardians are in stress. And we hear that a lot at the VRQA. On our phone line, for example, when I've taken calls, uh, it's often from parents and guardians in difficult circumstances. Um, what I'd say is a learning plan in terms of um, the amount of work it requires for a parent, so this is my, my claim, as you'll see when they're published, they're not voluminous documents. They can be a couple of pages. The examples we're going to be publishing, a, a number of them are a couple of pages. Uh, and so um, I, I would agree with the, with, um, the sentiment of the question if we were uh, imposing more of a burden on an applicant. So um, that, that would be my general claim. Yep. Yeah, so uh, the question was around circumstances where um, there may be sort of a, a crisis where the parent feels that um, the school environment is a dangerous place for the child to be and around waiting periods for registration for homeschooling. Basically, um, uh, an application can be put in uh, and uh, a child uh, needs to be still on the books, still enrolled from that school, but being enrolled is different from being present, is a way I'd... No, you would not. No, the VRQA, well, uh, in terms of the VRQA won't ask you for any medical certificates or anything like that. Correct, that's correct. Also, you can put in writing. Uh, to, to turn your mic on. Sorry. Um, you can also put in writing to the principal. You can, you can say it verbally, but I would also put it in writing 
just to say, I am removing my child for this reason, and then you are within your rights to remove your child immediately. Yep. Yeah, so in other words, the VRQA is not going to ask you, it's not going to ask anybody at the point of application, show me correspondence from your school principal. No. Okay. Uh, I've got one more, Ellen, and then we'll move on to exemptions. I've got a few people asking the same question. Um, so the question is, do existing registrations need to do learning plans? The initial slide said existing registrations do not need to do them, but if a review happens, what is being reviewed? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So it's one of the quirks of the new system is that there is no relationship between a learning plan and a review. Uh, so when a review happens, no, you don't have to show a learning plan. Uh, so part of that is practical. Um, so only 10% of the cohort is being reviewed each year. So if you can imagine a scenario where you register your child for homeschooling next year, 2018, and your child's six, and then it's only five years later that your child is picked up for review your child's 11. What would be the point of the review process having a methodology which was, we don't care what, what's going on now, but can you tell us about whether you did what you said you'd do five years ago? What's the point? Uh, the, the world's moved on. What the review will be doing is concentrating on the regulatory requirements. And in that way, it's the same as a, a learning plan assessment. A review will be asking, is there evidence that there's a learning program going on that, on the broken record, that substantially taken as a whole covers the eight learning areas? Uh, and so it has no relationship to a learning plan. And so I can guarantee, so this guarantee right now on camera, that in a review, no parent will be asked to get out their learning plan and tell us how they went with it. Okay? So are you going to discuss what's in a review? Yes, we're, about, we're going to discuss what's in a review and uh, Pavlina will get into that. Yes? Just one final question on the learning plan. So it's only in the first year of registration that a learning plan is asked and then it's just a rollover registration each year, unless there's a review. Yes, correct. So the question is, is uh, to paraphrase, that learning plans only required at the point of registration for the first year, and then things just roll over through annual notification. Uh, yes, correct. Um, the regulations do not require parents or guardians to maintain a learning plan over the years. If parents and guardians want to do that, that's fine, but that's their, their own business. The same with exemptions. Exemption request is only at the point of initial application. So in other words, let's say for example, next year you put in a uh, application with a learning plan which doesn't request any exemption. A year later, or six months later, or four months later, you decide, you know what, we're not going to be doing languages other than English, for an example, because the really good tutor we had for Mandarin moved town. Do you need to tell the VRQA that you're no longer doing Loche? No, you don't. You don't. That's your business. When it comes to review, it's simply a matter of saying, look, at the moment we're not doing loaf, but substantially taken as a whole, we've got a learning program that covers the learning areas. And Pavlina will get into more of that. But yeah, I can't stress enough that learning plan and exemption requests is only a point in time process that happens once at the initial point of application. Right? Okay. All right. 
I want to talk a bit about exemptions. So this, when I say exemptions, it's in your uh, learning plan templates, you'll see a section, are, are you applying for exemption for one or more learning areas? <coughs> Uh, now again, first point to make, current registrations, um, this doesn't apply. This doesn't apply to you. It does apply at initial registration uh, for new registrations from 2018. Okay? Now, what, what are the examples? And this is in your written documentation in your, in your PACs, in the FAQs document. It's, it's buried in there. I've talked about one example before when I talked about that example of a request for exemption from seven of the eight learning areas for a child that's uh, in deep distress, is going through troubles, and the parent is busting a gut to try their best for their child too. And that's, that's fine. So sometimes example, an exa a, a good grounds for exemption is, is those sorts of hopefully temporary circumstances. Sometimes it relates to the child's interest. Uh, so remember, there's no set curriculum or teaching and learning approach required. So a parent or guardian may know, and we hear a lot about this, that a particular set of activities or subject matter really engages a child, but other approaches, not so much. So, uh, in those circumstances, it's fine to apply for exemptions for one or more learning areas. So I got told a story by a colleague. I don't, I don't know if it was something she saw on TV or something she talked about, about a child who had uh, a fascination with uh, car washers and their operations. And, uh, and once got into studying the operations, just starred in terms of their learning. And, and, and studying the operation of a car wash connects to a hell of a lot of learning areas. So it's science, I guess, and maths, technology, arts, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, this child started and apparently ended up uh, being invited and flown over to the States to some sort of international car wash convention or, or something. So, I mean, that's, that's one example but what I'm talking about here is um, is the basic truism of not everyone learns in the same way. Not everyone is inspired by a learning program that, that breaks everything up into 12.5% each of the eight learning areas of math, science, etc. And so it's fine for a parent to say, you know what, we're not, we're not proposing to do these two learning areas because that, will, that won't engage my child grounds for an exemption. Uh, it could relate to disability and special needs or, or could relate to parent capacity to provide instruction. So I gave the load example before. Uh, so these days you can learn language in all sorts of ways, you don't really need an instructor. Uh, but it might be uh, a parent might not want to concentrate on load at the moment uh, because good language teachers don't grow on trees. Registered schools find that too. So a uh, number of them are exempted from life. Um, and probably what's not up there, the other general comments I'd say, someone at a forum said, well, what about, um, what about electives? I said, what do you mean? And the question was, is that as a child gets older in a registered school, the education program narrows. So in fact, someone at a forum in East Melbourne said, uh, look, I, I'm just out from England, my child's 16, 17, is actually doing their A-levels. Um, so they're not doing art and this, that, the other, it's narrowed down. Is that good ground for exemptions? Yes, it is. Uh, so I, I hope this um, sort of paints the picture here that it's not some sort of system that sort of artificially requires all homeschooling students to be doing the same things at the same time. It's more about the individual needs as reported by the parent. So any questions about exemptions? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, it does. So the question is, uh, is a child doing other activities such as doing a certificate course at TAFE uh, mean that they can be exempted from the related learning areas? Uh, yes, it does. So examples there, and this relates to partial homeschool enrolment. So a number of kids uh, in Victoria currently and in the future have an arrangement where they homeschool some of the time and they do classes or activities at a registered school, a local registered school, uh, particularly things like phys ed and art and things like that. So in that case, in a school case, a learning plan could say, uh, it, it could just note, yeah, we're covering five or six, but you won't find anything about art, um, arts and PE in this learning plan just because my child does it at school X. The same with uh, courses uh, in other sectors, uh, such as the vocational education and training sector. One of the published learning plans that will go up as part of the program, there's uh, a child doing a certificate three in active volunteering at Monash, for example, which is a way of covering a particular, I'll forget a bad example. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's, that's fine. And uh, the learning plan template will prompt you to think about those things. Exemptions? Any questions about exemptions? Um, There's a question sort of related to that. Um, so if your child wants to do a short course like TAFE, do they have to withdraw from homeschooling registration for that period or can they just do the course and then pick up where they left off? Uh, the complication of trying to answer that question off the cuff is that the vocational education training sector is very, very diverse. Uh, and so uh, what I'd encourage, if, if parents are any doubt, just give the VRQA a call. Uh, certainly a short course, if that is what it is, um, uh, yeah, it's certainly the case that a, uh, a, a child can remain registered for homeschooling for a short course. But if they go off to a full-time apprenticeship or traineeship, then they have effectively moved to another sector. It's not always clear-cut, so if there's any doubts, just give the VRQA a call. Yeah. Um, in that case, if it's a short course, the parent is still taking responsibility for the education of that child, so I, I can't see the issue. So the question was around where parents and children are trying to get negotiated arrangements with other providers. Can evidence be required to the parent and child about their status in homeschooling? Uh, yes, it can. If you ring the VRQA and request, it's not always going to guarantee a solution. That paperwork by itself may not guarantee a solution on the other end. I don't know, but yeah, uh, we can certainly clarify that someone is registered and the status of their registration, yes. Okay, I'm gonna come back for Q&A. So don't go away, folks. Uh, but I am gonna hand over to Pavlina to talk about reviews. So I'll get your... I'll get your presentation up. I think it might already be open down that way, yeah. Yep. It should come up in a second. Good. Excellent. All right. I'm on. Can you hear me? Um, okay, I've thought very quickly, we'll go through what the Victorian Home Ed Advisory Committee is there for, because not everybody knows about its existence and what, and what we're there for. So, um, as a result of um, our work this year, the Victorian Home Ed Advisory Committee was established. Um, it's composed of seven home educators, 
um, including myself. And we also have a disability advocate on there. And we also have a home ed academic, so an academic who specialises in home ed. And of course, uh, Chris, and we've also got some people from DET on there. And our role is basically to communicate um, the home education community's needs and perspectives on the paperwork and the implementation of the new regulations. So does anyone have any questions about, um, well, some people call it VHAC, I call it the HIC. Any questions on that? Um, the plan is, as far as we're concerned it is, we're going to be there forever. Um, <laughs> we would like to see it be, and what we have heard from DET and VRQA is that they certainly find it valuable. Um, so, yes, is the short answer. I, I, I understand that we have a commitment for the next 12 months at least. Is that right, Chris? Right. Yeah. And then after that? I don't know. But, you know, we fight hard. <laughs> so we'll see. Yes. Oh, sorry, the question was, is um, BHAC going to be there long term? Yeah, sorry. Remind me to repeat the questions if I don't. Any other questions? No. All right. Okay, so reviews under the regulations, and that's not working. <coughs> so reviews under the new regulations. Don't stress. Breathe. It's going to be okay. I promise. So you don't need to change how you home educate. And I think that's the biggest point that we all need to take away. Don't change what you're doing. Just figure out how you're going to communicate what you're doing to the VIQA when they ask you to. And that's part of what this session's about, to give you some ideas. So you don't have to submit a year's worth of work. So the VIQA are going to say to you, we are reviewing you. You could just talk about what you've done in the last two weeks. So if you've had a really, really busy two weeks, say, you know, you've gone to Eden to do some whale watching and, you know, you've gone to filmmaking class and, you know, you've done all these things in the last two weeks and, you know, you've been to the Tulip Festival and you've talked about the plants there and, you know, all these things. If you've covered substantially all of your KLAs in the last two weeks, you could just talk about the last two weeks. The VIQA might come back to you and say, we want a little bit more information. But if you can show that you are substantially covering your eight key learning areas, that's all you need to do. So you could talk about the previous 12 months. You could talk about the last six months. You don't even have to give a specified time period. You can say, you know, these are work samples that we've done just this year. So there is not, there's nothing specific in the regulations that says you need to demonstrate you've been doing things in the last 12 months or six months. The VIQA don't want to drain in paperwork. So don't submit every single, if you do worksheets, don't submit every single worksheet you've done. Just choose the best ones. You know, don't submit absolutely everything. It's not necessary. It's going to make their lives more difficult. And it's just going to put more workload on you trying to collate all that information. You don't have to report against the Victorian curriculum or the Australian curriculum. So we need to start talking about key learning areas. So forget the word curriculum. You might buy a curriculum program if that's how you do things, and that's a different thing altogether. But what you need to focus on is key learning areas. Do we all know our key learning areas? English, maths, science, technology, arts, language, phys ed health, and I'm missing one. No. No, it's technology. Before we cover technology. Anyway. Oh, no. What am I doing? Um, you know, HASS. You know, history, uh, social sciences. There you go. Important one. So, but equally important as everything else. So, we need to be talking key learning areas, not curriculum. And we don't need to be reporting against, if my child is 10 or 11, I don't need to be talking about what other kids would be doing at school in grade five, four, five. I don't need to be worried about that. I just need to be demonstrating that taken as a whole, our program covers the eight key learning areas. 
So some form of record keeping is advisable. However you do it, it's up to you and I'm going to show you some examples. So what do you have to show in a review? According to the regulations, you have to show that, you guys are going to know this out by heart, the education taken as a whole substantially addresses the eight key learning areas. Is that clear to everybody? That's all you need to do. And just like with your learning plans, if you're not covering some of them, just say why. Just say, my child is now 16. They spend 30 hours a week dancing with the Australian Ballet Company. We don't have time for languages other than English. This is what their, you know, career tracks taking them. Or my child struggles so much with reading and writing because they're severely dyslexic, we're not doing languages other than English, we're just concentrating on English for now. Does that make sense? When generally the education takes place, and as Chris said, this doesn't have to be on Mondays at 9am we do English, on Mondays at 10am we do load. It doesn't have to be that. And I'll show you an example. Where generally the education takes place. It doesn't have to be you know, we sit at the kitchen table to do English. Or, you know, we travel to our tutor's address to do load. It's just a general, you know, we learn in the community, we go to the museum, we go to the library, those sorts of things. So a couple of examples. So where education takes place. John learns at home and also at the library, museum, shops, the swimming pool, home ed group and many other locations. It's as simple as that. This is not a huge focus. The reason why you need to do it is because it's written into the regulations. But I get the feeling it's not a huge concern for the VRQA. When education occurs. So weekdays include a higher focus on educational activities, but learning takes place all year without regard to school days or hours. Even our holidays include educational activities. That's pretty general, isn't it? And it describes your philosophy on education too, doesn't it? But reading that sentence, you can sort of get a feel for how these people do home ed. So you... So if you just put that in, would that be enough? Yeah, I wouldn't copy it word for word. Right. <laughs> I'd come up with your own version. Right. Yeah. Um, so you choose how to demonstrate that you are covering the eight key learning areas. So you could just do conversation. So when the VRQA contact you, you could say, I want to have a chat on the phone about how we do this thing. I don't want to give you any paperwork. I'm not saying that that's necessarily going to get you over the line. I suppose it would depend on the quality of the conversation and how convinced they are. They might come back to you and say at the end of that conversation, could you just send us some examples of this trip to blah blah that you talked about that was, you know, that featured so, you know, so majorly in your year. Um, you could just do it by conversation or you could do it via a document, like a just a PDF and I'll give you some examples. Can you do it by post? Post? In mail? Snail mail? No, normal mail. Can you? Like normal mail. So actually a hard copy document you're asking. So the question was can you do it by a hard copy document? Yeah. I'm assuming you could, yes. Yep, so you could email it or you could print it out and you could mail it to them with a stamp. Yep. I would ring though and make sure that they have it considering Australia Post. Yeah. Okay, conversation. So it could be a phone call or interview and you could choose that as your primary way of reporting for a review. And it doesn't have to be at home, so you could do it at like the local library or something and your child doesn't have to be present. And you can invite the VRQA into your home, but you're not obligated to. So your other option is things like, for example, work samples. So these are actually work samples from our house. So down here, perfect example of a work sample. So this is a mud ball flinger. I don't know if you can see it. So it covers a lot of KLAs. So you've got English, you know, your handwriting, you're doing your spelling. There's technology, science. You're covering a lot of KLAs and your work sample is demonstrating in, 
engagement and interaction, isn't it? So if you can choose work samples that are rich work samples, that are providing a lot of information in a single work sample, you're better off doing that than providing you know, a maths worksheet here, a sample of handwriting over there. If you can choose things that are combining all these things, then I would be choosing those. So in the middle there is a story about Minecraft. So uh, that's my six-year-old. So she has sat down and she's just decided she's going to write about Minecraft, which is one of her favorite topics. And you can see she's done all the spelling herself. She's composed something. It's an instructional piece. You know, she's sat down, she's done some writing, she's practicing her typing skills, so she's doing a lot of KLAs there. And finally, so this was um, something that my boy and I did together. You can see that that's my handwriting. So that is okay, that is still a work sample. I would just have a little blurb that explains we were talking about the Earth, and he asked me what is the diameter of the Earth, and don't ask me how I know, but I knew the circumference. And so I said to him, I know the circumference is approximately 40,000 kilometers. And there's this thing, this algorithm, that you can use to work out the radius and therefore the diameter. So I demonstrated that for him, and we were talking about it, and we were having a conversation about it. That is still a work sample. We have talked about it, he has helped me calculate something, and it's still a valid work sample. So another way of keeping records is um, photo records or scrapbooks. So this is an example from our house again. So this is a bridge, and I've just written a blurb about what happened with it. So engineering build that took three days. The aim was to be able to drive the remote control Lego train at full speed around the track over the suspension bridge and around the corner without derailing. We made a video interview recounting the process and describing function and emotions. So KLAs we covered there, we covered maths, technology, science, arts, English. And I should have also put we've covered health because we were talking about emotions and how he felt. So this is a perfect example of the sort of thing that you could hand in if this is how you guys work. So we are natural learners. So as someone asked earlier about what is unschooling, we are natural learners. This is how we do it. So we go out, we explore, we do things that we're interested in, and in the process, we're covering a lot of really good concepts and we're doing a lot of learning. Anybody got any questions so far? Do you have to, do you say what you're doing is you have to keep these work samples you? So how, how you do that? So the question was, you have to keep work samples. So basically, the way I do it is I take a lot of photos. And then I annotate them. Do you have to do work samples? You don't have to. Right. So hang on. Let's, I'll keep going and you tell me if you still have questions. So here's another example. So if you don't want to keep work samples, you could write a report. So you could write something that says, we have a daily shared reading routine and listen to audiobooks regularly. In this way, I expose John to a wide range of books. I supplement our own books with a library selection each fortnight, but often revisit John's favorites. We take part in library activities and author talks that appeal. I have purchased alphabet and word posters for our walls. Further reading opportunities are provided in everyday activities of shopping, cooking, board games, and computer use. John enjoys drawing, and I add a sentence at his dictation to form a collection of picture stories we revisit regularly. In this way, I aim to nurture his love of stories without pressuring him to read. So that's a parent writing about how we go about our education. And remember, the onus is on you to provide opportunities. It's up to the child to take them up. So you can say, I have dragged them here and there and done this and done that. We've been to this workshop and that workshop. What that child has decided to engage in is up to that child. Your responsibility is to provide the opportunities. Does that make sense? Yes. And that is clearly demonstrating that you are thinking about what sort of opportunities are suited to that child. That child is clearly struggling to read and we don't want to be applying pressure on him, and this is how I'm nurturing his love of literature and reading. 
So you've got other options for recording. There's recording apps um, which can capture learning and can be set to match KLAs. So, and some of them will also run a report. So one app that has been talked about a fair bit is Kept Me. It's up to you whether you use it or not. It references back to the Victorian curriculum as far as I understand it, because I don't use it, but as far as I understand it, you can um, kind of tie it in with KLAs rather than Victorian curriculum. Um, this is an example of a page. Um, I would encourage you to have a look on your, I'm not going to read the whole thing out, but have a look on your handout. You've got, a, you've got that page in your handout. Um, that's one option of a recording app. Um, you can use other things though. There's things like Google Keep, which is like um, little post-it notes effectively. So you could take a photo and then annotate it. Um, and then hashtag it, so you know you've got tags. You know, so you could maybe tag it with. So if I was to say put my video or photo of my Lego train bridge, and then add that annotation as text underneath it, and then hashtag it with my science, um, technology, art, blah, blah blah, at the end. And then when you want, if you want to run, a, if you want to write your review based on individual KLAs then you could just search for the hashtags. Does that make sense? And so you can also do things that with things like Evernote. Um, Seesaw is one that's designed specifically for classrooms, um, but kids can be given their own account, so you can actually give them the responsibility for recording their learning. And they can post on their pictures, they can write things, they can, they can add whatever work they want on there. So there's, the possibilities are endless, um, and how you do it is entirely up to you and how it suits you. Other options are things like journals, so keep it simple and just write down what you've done and have a column for KLA. So for example, um, here are the activities, and then we need to change that colour. Um, kids involved, and then there are your KLAs. So for example, we went to gymnastics, they all did it. Which KLAs were involved? Phys Ed and Health. Art class, graphic design using ICT, only the child whose name begins with J was involved in that. The KLAs there were arts and technology. Does that make sense for everybody? So that's another way of doing it. And I wouldn't be doing this every day. If you're going to do it, maybe do it weekly, um, like a retrospective. You don't want this to be onerous. You don't want it to be interfering with the way you do things. Another option would be to do a spreadsheet. So um, you went to supermarket, J read ingredients panels and checked weight comparisons of items on special, and then you're highlighting you know, the boxes or you could put a number one so you can sort them later on or whatever. How do you do it? Any questions about this? So another way of gathering evidence is to record any competitions or assessments that your child undertakes you don't have to do these. So say you know you, you, your child enters the Australian Maths Comp, they'll get a little certificate. You could include that as a piece of evidence that you know, they're doing things. <clears throat> and finally, portfolio. You can take little bits and pieces from lots of different types of evidence. So you can, take, you can have some work samples in there. You can have you know, your certificate from the Australian Maths Competition you can put in bits of your scrapbook. So it doesn't have to be all one way. There, there are no guidelines because it is recognised that we all do things so differently. And if you start to put rigid structures in place about this is how you must do it, then you're starting to change the way people home educate. Does that make sense? We don't want you feeling like this. <laughs> So if you have any questions, this slide is in your pack. Feel free to contact any of us. We're more than happy to communicate. And that's me down the bottom. Any questions? I don't understand what's required for a review. So if you, if you get a... Yes. Um, so so you include some sort of all, it's just say so you, you have to do a review. So what actually do you have to do besides doing it for the key eight learning areas? I understand you have to relate yep. to the key eight learning areas. Okay, so the question is what do you actually have to do for a review? Yeah. 
Is that the summary? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So, can I use my family as an example? Okay, so I've just gotten an email. It's February. We're going to be reviewed in July. So, I'm going to look back through my photos and my notes that I've taken, um, and I'm going to think about what are the what are the really interesting things that we've done that have that are, that have been really rich experiences. So you're doing this in July. Yeah. Oh, whenever. So well, I'm going to get the notice in February, March, and reviews are happening June to October. Was that right? Yes. Yeah, so reviews are happening from April to Octo October. October. There you go. April to October. So. So I'm going to have a look through and see what we've done in the last six months, 12 months, whatever, or the, even the last couple of months, and think about what have we done that can demonstrate a lot of really interesting educational experiences and that we are covering our eight key learning areas. So I might take the filmmaking course that my child does. So that covers a lot of, eight, of, a lot of learning areas. You know, we're covering English, we're covering technology, we're covering arts. You know, we're covering a lot of things there, and I might, when they've finally produced their film, if they've produced their film by then, I might even include their film. And then I'm going to think about, okay, well, what else do I need to demonstrate that we're covering? So maths, say. So he really loves writing, um, writing code, and he loves binary numbers. So I might write a little bit about that. I might just say, you know, this is what he loves doing. I would say it's more than one or two sentences, but I would try and find things that are going to demonstrate that stuff's happening in your house that equals learning. And I mean, let's face it, we all know that if our kids are breathing, they are learning. You can't stop them learning. And so it's just about thinking about what can I choose that's going to show someone else how we're going about that. It doesn't have to be detailed. It doesn't have to be onerous. It doesn't have to be, like, from my perspective, I would like to think that I'd be able to get together my materials for a review in a week. I wouldn't think that it would take me more than a week to look through the stuff I have. And I don't keep meticulous records. I do a lot of photos. I do a bit of journaling or annotating or whatever. But I'm not there every week, you know, this is what I'm doing every single day. So it's more than one or two sentences, what do you think for each eight I think whatever you think you need to do to demonstrate right. what you're doing. Does that make sense? I don't yeah, know. It, it does. So the, the question here is, uh, uh, if it's more than one or two sentences, uh, what exactly is required, yeah. right? That the issue about the reason why one or two sentences wouldn't be enough is that uh, you can make a claim. You can say, yes, we're doing lots of English. She's read lots of books. Uh, and then the question would come back, that's very interesting. Can you be a little bit more specific? Because anyone can make a general claim. But it's a, what's a regular looking for? Evidence. And evidence could be examples of all of those things that were presented or other things. So in terms of process, the letter comes out in February or March. And it says, congratulations, aren't you lucky? Your child's up for review. It'll probably nominate a month. It'll probably say, how about July? If July is not good for you, you're going to be overseas, you're going to be busy or what have you it's fine to ring back or contact us back and say, July's not good, how about June or August or September? That's fine. I think uh, in terms of review processes, it, it can happen in sort of uh, three different ways. If, if a parent would prefer not, and I can under, understand this, would prefer not necessarily to have a face-to-face -face meeting or even a phone call, they might be able to pull together some sort of the materials that Pavlina is talking about and say, here's a Here's a 10 page pack here that uh, with uh, that word again, indicative rather than comprehensive. 
that has uh, that shows a lot of uh, learning activity taken th uh, that's happened over the last period of time. And together, it shows clearly that there's been a learning program going on that substantially taken as a whole covers the eight key learning areas. Send it in by a snail mail or email or what have you. Um, that will be assessed, and if it's fine, it's notification back. Thank you. Review's over. So that's a desktop review without ever having the pleasure of meeting us face to face or speaking to us on the phone. But other times, uh, a parent, it'll be interesting to see um, how this plays out. At a couple of forums, some a uh, number of people have said, oh no, we wouldn't do that. We'd, we'd prefer to speak to you. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I'm not used to uh, people actually wanting to speak to regulators. <laughs> so um, anyway, we'll see how it goes. So, but, um, you know, it's what the parent wants. So the, the letter will sort of invite this. Uh, do you want to do it that way, desktop? Or would you prefer to have a, a, a telephone conversation about it? And in the telephone conversation, it's going to be about the question's going to be, so, parent, um, guardian, tell us, how are you providing an education program that taken as a whole covers the eight? What are you doing for this? What are you doing for that? And th that process is a little more messy because consistent with the question before, wouldn't just be a phone call. It would be the VRQA officer annotating and then sending an email saying, is that my understanding, et cetera. So there's, it's not quite as simple as just a phone call, or it might be, thanks for telling us about that, can you put in a couple of work samples or something like that to, to show it? Or it might be a few people have said, uh, we want to meet you. <laughs> uh, you're welcome to our home, or let's meet at a local library or, or what have you. We have no right to enter your home. There's nothing in the regulations about the home environment, uh, but if you invite us, um, we'd, we'd uh, say yes. Uh, so it's sort of, it's that sort of three different ways, if you, if you like, if that makes sense. The question. I guess the, the slightly inexact part of that um, statement is the substantially, the word substantially which is a bit open to interpretation. So I just wanted to come back to something I think I heard you say earlier, that the assessment of the learning plan or the review and so forth wouldn't be comparing our children to what a child in a registered school would be covering at that point or covering Correct. in that subject area. Yes, and there's information about this in the documentation in the FAQs. There's a sentence, it's expressed negatively, it could probably be would have been better to express it positively. <clears throat> but it says something like, what the VRQA will not do in learning plan assessment or review process is have a sort of a predetermined benchmark for a nine-year-old's learning plan should look like this. And when we go to a review, uh, a nine-year-old's work samples or whatever should look like that. Uh, because that would be unfair and inconsistent with the ethos of the of the regulations, which is it depends on the individual circumstances of the child as determined by the parent. That would be discriminatory, that such approach. So there is nothing in the regulations that at review time that requires a parent to uh, submit materials that somehow shows they've gone from a to B in achievement. There's nothing that requires that assessment materials are provided. So, uh, for example, if someone put together a, a bit of a pack to demonstrate that it's been covered and there was nothing in there, there weren't online tests in there or, or what have you, it was all uh, work samples or um, learning journals, etc. that would be fine. Yes. So does that make sense? Yes. And just to clarify, so it would be the parents' belief that their child was learning in these areas that was enough for you, so long as we could provide. Yes. 
the, so the Yes, that's right. The, the regulations are really about activity. Is there an education program going on? It's not about some sort of assessment of, um, well, get myself tongue tied here. It's not about our judgments about second guessing the parent's judgment about whether that learning program is fit for purpose for that child. That's up to the parent. So that comes back to why it's no good to just have one or two sentences. The, the requirements require substance, so we need to show depth of learning in each, each of the eight areas. Rather, so perhaps like a page rather, or, you know, yeah, as I, well as work samples. I, I, I think so. The only thing I'd say around depth is that it's still indicative rather than comprehensive. So it's not a need with reviews, as Pavlina said, there's nothing in the regulations around the, the backward period. It's, it's not 12 months, it's not six months. So you may have stuff from the past two weeks that clearly demonstrates that there's a learning program going on. But uh, I don't know, it's, we haven't done it yet, so it's hard to answer, but I, I don't think it'll be the case that, you know, we would say, you've submitted five work samples for maths, but we need seven. Why? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd still say indicative rather than comprehensive. And I think the VHIAC uh, at a session will be providing more information around uh, so review samples, examples, a bit like how you've seen up here, uh, as well as just learning plan guidance, which is coming up. Yeah. Um, the way I think about reviews is a bit like learning plans. So like just like you guys have two learning plan templates in front of you, you've got the one that's divided up by KLAs and then you've got the one that's integrated. That's kind of how I think about reviews. Like I think you could do a review, this is what we've done for English, this is what we've done for maths, this is what we've done for technology. Or you could do a more kind of integrated approach such as, you yeah. know, your photo record thing where you're then listing what KLAs you've covered. Yeah. This is what this is the activity we did. These are the KLAs we covered. Yeah, so in Pavlina's example of the globe, and all that, which is kind of gave me pause to think because a six-year-old knows more about circumference and diameter and all that than I do, is, but that, that's an example of activities, sets of activities that can be linked to so many different. And I've heard a lot about that at the forums, <coughs> how you know, everything's a learning activity, shopping is a learning activity, um, doing the groceries is a learning activity. So, uh, yeah, I think that it's been really beneficial having the homeschoolers help us design that second template, integrated template, because the bureaucrats left alone only came up with the <laughs> old fashioned sort of template, which is a bit sort of old hat. The world doesn't work by yeah, hermetically sealing English learning from mass learning from. Yeah. Just to clarify to education, I'm not saying you personally are old hat or anything like that. I think you're great. Just curiosity, does the SSA committee completely frame or can you be crazy and opt in to do it the way to get it out of the way? Right. Uh, so the question was can the 10% be, uh, is the 10% completely random? Or can you be, quote, crazy, which is not a term I would choose to use, and opt in to uh, get it out of the way? Um, actually, we had this question at Werribee last night. Uh, you can volunteer. Yes, you can. Uh, but I'm not sure how it's going to work entirely. So we're going to do up to 10%. I think if you volunteer, um, there's natural attrition. So in February or March, we might select the 10% and then some of them, like 10 people, will uh, drop out of homeschooling or will submit their kids to school. Hopefully not just because they've been selected <laughs> for review. So in that case, we might be looking for top-ups. Uh, in that case, yeah, there could be volunteers. No, you, uh, the question is, can I email tomorrow and say, ah, no, you can't, because the new regulations aren't in 
force yet, and so we don't have the power to lodge a review. So it sounds like you're still worried about the process. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, so you can volunteer, but you'll just need a little bit of patience, probably until March at the earliest next year. Yeah, I wasn't expecting people to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, okay, so we'll do it. Uh, so it did come up last night, the Werribee. Um, yeah, we'll, what, so what we'll do in, in uh, we'll keep communicating and when we need to call for top ups, which I'm presuming will happen, we'll, we'll ask for volunteers. Uh, it's strange. It's kind of cool. I'm not used. To, I'm a sort of regulator. I've never, I've, I've never had um, <laughs> people. Certainly not in an apprenticeship regulation. Saying, please regulate me. Uh, but yeah, I, I understand the, I think the get it out of the way element. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd the only thing I'd say I won't repeat the question. Um, if, if six hundred people volunteer, then we've got a problem at the VRQA. We won't be able to do it. Like because the VRQA team is expanding from two to five, uh, so we can't do. We'll be struggling to do three hundred, which is a ten percent reviews. Anyway, enough about the VRQA's problems. But yeah, there's a there's a limit to it. Any questions online yeah. about reviews? Yeah. So some people have asked if um, instead of meeting face to face, they could have a review um, or speak face to face over Skype. Is that an option? Uh, yes. Uh, FaceTime Skype is yeah perfectly fine. Um, and for some of the key learning areas, um, someone's asking if students can work together in groups of five or six. Will that would that still be okay? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, and that's the case under the existing and new regime, so tutors, group activities with Pavlina, it's um, sort of very, you know, oh. not a very, very popular, very yeah. strong so feature of So, for education. example, um, the example that I gave earlier about our filmmaking, I mean, that's nine home ed kids working together um, to produce something and, you know, to engage in the learning activity. So, yeah, sure. And, you know, group work's really important. And, you know, you could even argue that that comes under health because it's life skills. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Yep. Maybe we might take a couple of more questions if there are any. But for those who are at home, what we're going to try to do, have we been bombarded with questions online, Alan? Um, has been quite a few questions. I think a number of them have been answered as you've gone along, though. Right. So um, what, yeah. yeah. Um, so what we'll do is, for the ones that haven't been answered, uh, this video is going to be put on the BRQA website along with a transcript. And I think we'll also include any questions that we haven't answered. We'll get together and try and answer them. So they'll be on the website. Uh, sound okay? Yeah. So do it that way. Is there any final question or two? Um, Either here or there? Um, a few general ones. Yeah, just pick one. Um, so if um, if you don't, since you're not following a curriculum, um, if the VRQA think you're not covering an area, um, how will they let you know? Uh, yeah, so it's an interesting question. So, again, if you're not covering one area, that's not a showstopper because it's, remember, it's substantially taken as a whole, covers the learning areas. So not covering one is, isn't a, isn't a hanging offence. Uh, but if, if it, uh, the main point is if the VRQA, whether it's that initial registration or review, have something to say to you, like, I would like more information or, 
our obligation is to specify why. You know, what are, we can't just say, you're nearly there, but not quite. Good luck. It's, you're nearly there, but we're actually, there's, there's nothing in your learning plan in, in relation to three learning areas, yet you're not asking for an exemption. So that's, can you think about either applying for exemption or uh, some more information on the other learning? Do you know what I mean? It's around, uh, it's around that sort of approach of specifying what we're looking for, not just saying that, that generally it's not quite there. We'll probably, what do you think? Shall we, who wants to go home? Uh, so look, thanks very much for coming. Uh, as I've said this before, special thanks to Pavlina. Uh, I'm on the Victorian government payroll. I get paid for doing this sort of stuff. Uh, thanks to your taxes, thank you. Pavlina and her colleagues uh, volunteer their time to do this. So thank you very much. <laughs>